Now, campuses have, have uh, appeared several times in our discussion already. Have they become the key battleground, as far as you're concerned, for this issue in general, but specifically for the anti-Israel and anti-Semitism points? Campuses are always the key uh, focal point because campuses are always a reflection of the future. Um, I understand Barack Obama uh, and his views on the world because I knew him as a student, um, and I knew the forces that shaped his thinking as a young student with an open mind, minds tend to close fairly early in, in, in one's life. And so universities are the crucial uh, place where ideas are formed and often very bad ideas are formed. Universities today uh, are largely a failure when it comes to engaging in nuanced discussion of complicated issues, particularly around the Middle East. Uh, I, it's very difficult to have a calibrated, nuanced, intelligent discussion of the pros and cons of the Palestinian narrative, the Israeli narrative. People just simply go down one path or the other. Uh, all I try to do in my discussions of the Middle East is to introduce some degree of nuance and complexity to the discussion, and it's an uphill fight. But, but why should that be? I mean, as we all know, universities should be the place where you can take risk with ideas, where in fact you can argue the points in a different way to, say, real life and not be punished for it. Why have they become the opposite of that? Well, I think there are many students who would like to see universities be places where you can take risks. But there is a small group, I estimated on American campuses, somewhere between 10, maybe 15, sometimes 20 percent, that uh, are Stalinists, essentially, are heirs to the old Stalinist approach, or are fundamentalists on the other side that just don't want to hear opposing points of view. And they are loud, and they are often violent, and they threaten to shut down universities, and administrators pay far too much attention to them. I'm hearing many, many complaints from university students today. Uh, about uh, the cutting off of debate and academic institutions being uh, difficult places to explore dangerous ideas. I taught a course at Harvard uh, called Taboo, uh, Subjects You Can't Discuss at Universities, and it was a very successful course. People clamored to hear about these kinds of issues. They wanted to talk about race and gender and the kinds of issues that are very difficult to talk about on campus torture. Uh, Israel, the Palestinian conflict, and they wanted to talk about it in a nuanced way, but they're, they're stopped from doing it by many uh, on the campus, and that filters up to the university. Having said that, let me make one very mm. controversial point. Now, this point has a lot of exceptions, a lot of exceptions, but I have never met as a group a less courageous group of people in my 50 years of teaching than tenured full professors at major universities. Uh, I have never met a group that is unwilling to express views that they honestly believe in if they believe their views will offend students or upset students. You'd think that tenure would protect. It doesn't. Um, what tenure does is it just enables professors uh, to become intellectually lazy and to refuse to express uh, views that might offend students because it will affect their student evaluations, their ability to go to other universities, their ability to obtain honorary degrees, their ability to be admitted to the American Academy or other academies of arts and sciences. So don't count on the faculty to speak out. You will always be disappointed. On university campuses, the only people in general who are prepared to speak out against the tyranny of the hard left are students, not faculty members, and certainly not administrators. If that's the case, and I, that's quite a shocking thing to say, because we're always told that uh, as you're building your career as an academic, you stay silent, and then you can express your views once you uh, hit the top point. But if that's correct, what hope is there then to overturn some of the things that we're seeing? Because students are transient. Students are there for three, four years, perhaps, mm -hmm. before moving on. What can you see in the arsenal? What is there that's going to you know, kind of change a tide on this debate? Well, I think we have to recognize that universities consist not only of the current student body, four years, the current faculty, maybe 20 or 30 years, but also the alumni base, people who have a major stake in the credibility of the universities and people who support the universities. They have to speak out more, and uh, students have to push their professors to express views. When I speak at universities, and I do all over the world, um, making the case for Israel. And I make the nuanced uh, two-state solution, center-liberal case for Israel. Inevitably, I get calls the next day from professors who I know, 
And the call usually comes in the form of a whisper on the phone. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking out on behalf of Israel. Why won't you speak out? Well, I, I'm concerned that it'll affect my this or that, and I'm up for chairmanship of the department, and I have a grant that's pending, and I have an application for this group or that group. Everybody has an excuse for why they won't speak out. But if students pressure them to speak out, I think it could have an impact. That's interesting, uh, but I note your point about alumni as well. Do you think that alumni are using their power sufficient, their economic power sufficiently, in order to affect change on campus? No, they only do it in extreme cases. So that, for example, if any American university ever were to divest from Israel, we would be able to bring that university down, and we would. Um, uh, when Hampshire University faculty voted to divest from Israel, I called the president. And I said, if you divest from Israel, we, the alumni, I was the father mm. of a, an alum, we will divest from Hampshire and we will shut you down. Oh, how can you shut down a university? We will fight fire with fire. And Did divestment, they, re they, and they reversed it. And no American university has accepted divestment. And if any did, we would marshal all the alumni to uh, make their power known. Uh, we have to use power. We have to use our moral power, our academic power, our intellectual power our political power and our economic power to make sure that at least falsehoods don't become the, 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 the basic accepted mode of thinking on university campuses. And do you think outside of America that Jewish communities are too shy of using the same power, for example in Britain? In the United States it's not only the Jewish community, it's the pro-Israel community. Mm -hmm. And the pro-Israel community is much broader than the Jewish community. And I think there are pro-Israel uh, people all over the world who would be upset. There are also people who are just favorable to free speech, uh, who have no interests in the Middle East, but who are upset at the way in which the direction of campuses are moving on issues like free speech, trigger warnings, academic freedom, freedom for thee, but not for me, but not for thee. That's been the, the approach. And there have been bullying tactics used on university campuses. There are no safe spaces today for Christians on campus, for uh, Jewish supporters of Israel, for supporters of free speech. People who come on campus to support free speech are shut down today, just like people who came on campus to support Israel. Israel is almost always the canary in the mine shaft, but it's spreading beyond Israel to intolerance toward any views that are different from the politically correct ones expressed. Very few students know the origin of political correctness, that it's a Stalinist concept that was used to murder artists and writers and, and, and musicians who didn't toe to the correct political line. And the idea that we now look upon political correctness as some kind of a positive concept is so ahistorical and reflects such amazing ignorance. And I suppose what we're seeing is that as this sort of theory of intersectionality increase in popularity, that is having a squeezing effect on freedom on campus. Let's be very clear what intersectionality is. It's an academic euphemism for anti-Semitism. Um, intersectionality says that all the evils that oppress favored groups, favored groups, meaning only certain groups that are politically correct, are brought about by a combination of colonialism, imperialism, Zionism, Jews, Israel. And uh, we have to all stand together against the oppressors, we the oppressed. But there's no room for Jews among the oppressed. There's no room for Israel among the oppressed. There's no room for Muslims among the oppressors. There's no room for the enemies of Israel and the enemies of Jews among the oppressors. So it's highly selective. Nobody should fall for the academic nonsense called intersectionality. It has, makes no sense historically. It makes no sense empirically. It makes no sense morally. And yet at the Democratic Convention, there were signs all over saying intersectionality matters. Uh, and we have to fight that, uh, just like we have to fight Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. And uh, the concept is a good one, but the organization has been taken over by radical anti-Semites uh, who believe that only one nation in the world engages in genocide and apartheid, and that is the nation state of the Jewish people. So we have to develop alternate ways of defending black lives and other lives, but not allow them to say, if you want to support civil rights, you have to abandon Israel. If you want to support gay rights, you have to abandon Israel. If you want to support environmental rights, you have to reject Israel. We won't accept that, nor will we accept the litmus test 
Jews are capable and supporters of Israel are capable of creating our own human rights organizations, our own gay rights organizations, our own civil rights organizations, and we will do that because we will not partner with anti-Semites or anti-Zionists. What are, what are the three pieces of advice you would give to campus students who are facing this perfect storm of conditions uh, you've described? Always fight back. Uh, always um, respond. Respond in kind. When they uh, create uh, theater on the university campus, uh, making students go through checkpoints, you create counter theater. Uh, having fake explosions blowing up people, having buses on the campus blowing up, taking students from one place to another. Make the students understand why the checkpoints were necessary. They weren't there to repress, they were there to prevent uh, terrorism. Always um, favor free speech. Don't ever try to suppress speech. You will always lose if you try to stop Justice for Palestine speakers or anti-Israel speakers from coming on campus. Use their bigotry as a weapon in your favor. Turn it against them. Encourage their speech on campus. Make sure your speech is encouraged on campus. And finally, demand equality. Everything must be equal. So for example, uh, at the University of California at Berkeley, they're trying to promote a course on why Israel shouldn't exist. Um, and they say academic freedom. So have somebody propose a course on why there is no such thing as the Palestinian people. I don't believe that for a minute. But let them propose a course and see if academic freedom is really at work, or selective use of academic freedom to favor one point of view. Constantly challenge.